Hey, first grade. Today we are going to read the story of Thumbelina. Our learning objectives are to identify elements of stories and elements of a folktale that you heard read aloud. Um, we will identify similarities and differences in two folktales, uh, demonstrate an understanding of the word scarcely, and use a graphic organizer to compare and contrast two folktales. Our key vocabulary are dwelling, extravagance, foreign, fragrant, and scarcely. Dwelling. Dwelling is a noun, and it is a home or a place where people or animals live. Peter Rabbit left his dwelling to sneak into the farmer's vegetable patch. Extravagance. Extravagance is also a noun, and it means luxury and splendor. Okay. The king's daughter had every extravagance. She was given everything she could ever want. I put a castle because castle is luxury and splendor. Okay. Foreign. Foreign is an adjective. Remember, adjectives are our descriptive words, meaning they describe someone or something. Foreign means unfamiliar. Okay. Something you're not used to. You don't know very well. Um, I went ahead and put a picture of the Eiffel Tower in France because France is foreign to me. I am not very familiar with France. I don't know much about it. Okay. Um, Johnny's new bed made his bedroom feel like a foreign place. Fragrant. Fragrant is also an adjective and fragrant means having a pleasant smell. In the spring, fragrant flowers bloomed at the side of Penny's house. Scarcely is an adverb, and it means barely, hardly, almost not. The lemons were so sour that Trey was scarcely able to eat them. So he was barely able to eat them. He almost could not eat them. Let's do a little review. So people all over the world love listening to and telling stories, right? And some of the stories that are told around the world are quite similar to each other, even though the stories originated in different places. Although the variations come from different countries or lands, the characters can have similar adventures and face similar conflicts. What are the elements of a story? Characters, so the people or animals that the story is about. The setting, which is where and when the story takes place. The plot, which is what happens in the story, so beginning, middle, and end. And then the conflict. And what is a conflict? The conflict of the story is the problem that the characters face, right? Okay, what is a folk tale? What is a folk tale? A folk tale is a story that someone made up long ago and that has been told again and again. Okay. Is it true or is it made believe? It's made believe. How do you know that Tom Thumb was fictional? How do we know that Tom Thumb was fictional? Because people are not as small as thumbs and animals can't talk. In which land or country did the story of Tom Thumb originate? The story of Tom Thumb originated in England. Okay. Who were the characters in Tom Thumb? Tom Thumb, his parents, the strange man, the robbers, the milkmaid, and the wolf, right? What adventures did Tom Thumb have? He stopped two robbers and outsmarted a wolf. And he also outsmarted the stranger, right? What advent, oops, I just read that one. How was Tom Thumb able to help other people? He helped to save the cook and the maid from robbers, right? Okay, so remember, Tom Thumb was able to do many great things even though he was no bigger than the size of a thumb. Today, you're going to hear a story that comes from a different land, but who's um, but whose character is also main character is also tiny like Tom Thumb. Today's read aloud originated in a country called Denmark many, many years ago. It was first written by a man named Hans Christian Andersen. 
This is the continent of Europe. Okay, we've talked about Europe a few times now. And this red spot is the country of Denmark. All right. Our key vocabulary, remember, dwelling, extravagance, foreign, fragrant, and scarcely. Listen carefully to hear how folk tales of Thumbelina and Tom Thumb are similar and different. Once there was a woman who wanted a child more than anything in the world. At last, in loneliness and sorrow, she went to a wise old woman and spoke of her desire. Why did the woman go to see the wise woman? Because she wanted a child, right? That's as easy as winking, said the wise old woman. Take this seed and plant it in a flower pot filled with good, rich earth. Water it carefully and guard it very well. The woman did as the wise old woman had said. The first time she watered the seed, a large and brilliant flower sprang up. It was still a bud, its petals tightly closed. The woman bent down to kiss the flower, but the moment her lips touched the silky petals, they began to open. The woman could not believe her eyes. There inside sat a tiny little girl. She was perfectly formed, as graceful as the flower from which she had come. When the woman held her, she discovered that the tiny girl was scarcely the, the size of her thumb. Remember, scarcely means barely, hardly, or almost not. The girl was barely as tall as the woman's thumb. Though she was a wonderful child in every way, she never grew at all. She was called Thumbelina and was treated with great extravagance and care. So if Thumbelina was treated with great extravagance, it means that she lived a life of luxury and had everything she could ever want or need. Her cradle was a polished walnut shell. Each night she would sleep between fresh flower petals and in the daytime, she liked to sit on a table and sing in the sunlight. Her voice was very beautiful, high and haunting and silvery. One night, she lay sleeping, and a toad hopped in at the window. What a lovely wife for my son, she said. Without even looking around her, she took up the walnut shell and hopped off with it into the garden. Here, look what I brought you, said the toad proudly to her son. But the only sound he could utter was croak, croak, croak. Don't talk so loud or you'll wake her, complained the mother toad. She might still run away from us. So the mother toad and her son went back to their home near the stream's edge. They placed Thumbelina on a lily pad in the middle of the water so that she could not escape. In the morning, Thumbelina woke up and looked all around her at the great arching sky. She felt her lily pad rock with the motion of the stream and cried out in terror. Why do you think Thumbelina is scared? Because she was kidnapped, right? I'd be scared. The mother toad asked her son, oh, sorry, the mother toad and her son heard Thumbelina crying and went to see what was the matter. Thinking that Thumbelina was just crying out of loneliness, they ignored her and returned to making wedding plans. Upon hearing her sobs, a fish swimming in the water below came to the surface and looked curiously at Thumbelina. A butterfly also heard the cries and flew over to see what was wrong. Oh, please help me, she said. I must get away from here. And so the fish began to gnaw at the lily stalk with his sharp little teeth. So the lily stalk is under the water and the stalk holds the lily pad in place until the fish came along and started chewing it, okay? At last, the leaf broke free and floated down the stream. Away went Thumbelina, gently spinning with the current. Gradually, her fear left her and she began to enjoy the journey. Never before had she been outside. Thumbelina floated down the river far, far away from the mother toad and her son. 
It was summertime, and she spent the next several months drifting peacefully from place to place along the shore. When it rained, she slept under a large spreading leaf to shelter herself from the rain. For food, she sipped nectar from the flowers, ate wild berries, and drank the dew that lay on the leaves at dawn. So dew is drops of water that forms on cool surfaces at night. You might see it on the grass sometimes. All the while, she listened to the birds chirping in the trees above her and made friends with the butterflies that floated in the breeze nearby. Before long, though, summer came to an end, and autumn quickly passed. The cold chill of winter soon filled the air. There were no more berries for food, and all the birds and butterflies had disappeared. Thumbelina was cold and hungry. Now she was truly alone, and the place was a foreign land to her. Remember, foreign means unfamiliar. What do you think is going to happen to Thumbelina now? Let's see if you're right. And then it started to snow. The snow came at her in, in white swirling clouds, and she quickly wrapped herself up in a leaf and curled up under a mushroom and tried to keep herself dry. Still, she shivered with cold. So what season is it now if summer has ended and autumn has passed? winter. Do you think that Thumbelina is as happy in the winter as she was in the summer and in the autumn? Probably not. She doesn't look too comfy. Not far away, a field mouse was gathering some last bits of kindling to burn in her fireplace during the winter. Kindling is dry sticks and twigs that are used to start fires. When she saw Thumbelina, she said, My poor dear, you are nearly frozen with cold. You must come home and spend the winter with me. I have plenty to eat, and my home is warm and dry. Thumbelina graciously accepted the invitation and followed the field mouse to a small hole in the ground. As they descended into the tunnel, Thumbelina realized that she was in the snug, small dwelling of a field mouse. So Thumbelina was in the field mouse's home. Corn was piled up all around her, and its smell was in the air. Please, said Thumbelina, could I have a bit of corn to eat? You poor dear thing, the field mouse answered kindly. You had better come into my room and have dinner with me. The two got on well together, and after some days, the field mouse invited Thumbelina to work for her and stay the winter. Every day, Thumbelina helped the field mouse with her housework, and they would spend the rest of the day enjoying a cup of tea and chatting before the fire. Thumbelina soon grew very fond of the field mouse. She was happy to have found such a good and kind friend. So what characters have we met so far? Thumbelina... Thumbelina's mom, the old wise woman, the toads, and the field mouse, right? Why did the mother toad take Thumbelina? As, um, well, the mother toad wanted Thumbelina to marry her son, right? How does the field mouse treat Thumbelina? The field mouse is treating her pretty well, I think. Late one evening, the field mouse said to the dust said to dust the floor and polish everything in the room until it shone. An important visitor was coming to call. This was a mole who was very rich and wore a sleek velvet coat, but he had very poor eyesight, and even with his glasses, he could barely see. Here, the word glasses means a pair of lenses worn over the eyes to help someone see. He hated the sun, and mocked, which means made fun of, all the creatures who lived outdoors. The field mouse, however, was impressed by the mole's riches. She told Thumbelina to sing for him and tell stories of her travels. As he listened to Thumbelina's beautiful voice, the mole fell in love with her. The next time he came to visit, he said he would show them his rooms underground. By the pale light of a piece of torchwood, he led them through a long, twisting passage. Suddenly, they came upon a swallow lying sprawled in the passageway. 
Thumbelina felt very sorry for the swallow, but the mole kicked at him with his stumpy legs. What a pitiful life to be a bird, he said. A creature who does nothing all day but fly from branch to branch is not prepared for winter. What do you think of the way that the mole is treating the swallow? I don't like that, do you? Do you think that's a nice way to treat or talk to somebody? No. Thumbelina said nothing and let the mole and the field mouse walk on ahead. Goodbye, swallow, she said. It might have been you who sang to me this summer when all the trees were green. She laid her head on his soft feathers for a moment, then darted back in fear. Something moved inside him with slow, steady rhythm of a heartbeat. The bird was not dead. He was merely numbed with cold. The warmth of Thumbelina's body had stirred him back to life. Each night after that, she crept out of the bed to tend the swallow. As he grew stronger, he told her how he had torn his wing on a thorn bush. The other swallows had flown away from the warm country, flown away to the warm countries, but he had not been able to keep up with them. At last, he could go no farther, and he had plummeted to the ground. Thumbelina kept the swallow a secret from the field mouse and the mole. Why do you think Thumbelina is keeping the swallow a secret? She's probably worried she might get in trouble. When the spring warmed the earth once more, Thumbelina knew it was time for the swallow to go. His wing had healed now. Each night he fluttered it over and over again, strengthening it for flying. Won't you come with me? He asked her, you can easily sit upon my back and I will carry you away into the leafy woods. But Thumbelina could not bring herself to abandon the field mouse who had kept her from starving. To abandon someone means to leave them alone and never return to them. She made a hole in the roof of the passageway and watched longingly as the swallow flew out into the sunshine. She felt that all the pleasure in her life was going with him. Every evening now, the mole came to call on Thumbelina. He made her sing until her voice grew hoarse. So the mole made her sing so much that her voice became weak and scratchy. Whenever she stopped, he prodded her to continue. This was the way he loved her. How do you think the mole made Thumbelina feel? Probably not very good, right? He seems kind of bossy, pushy. Why doesn't Thumbelina stick up for herself? Because she knows that the field mouse finds the mole very important and doesn't want to disappoint the person that helped her out, right? Without ever once asking Thumbelina, the mole and the field mouse agreed that she would be married to him in autumn. But Thumbelina did not want to marry the mole, and she wept, wept bitterly whenever she thought of their wedding day. Every morning when the sun rose and every evening when it set, she was allowed to go to the door sill and stand outside. In the heat of August, the corn had grown as high as a forest. When the wind blew the stalks apart, she could see the bright pieces of sky, how beautiful it was. She did not know how she would live deep inside the earth with the mole, whom she now despised or disliked more than ever. As the time of her wedding drew closer, she sobbed out her fears to the field mouse. Nonsense, said the field mouse. Don't be stubborn. His velvet coat is handsome, and the food in his pantry is fit for a queen. Thumbelina understood then that she was trapped as surely as if she were in a cage. Summer was ending, and she knew she would never be able to survive outside again through the harsh, cold months of winter. What words or sentences tells you how Thumbelina is feeling? She said that she felt trapped, right? Like she was in a cage, right? But now the wedding day had come. For the last time, she crept to the door, still, the door sill and to stand in the sunshine. She knew the mole would never permit her to leave his side. She wept as, the, as she felt the warmth upon her face and made ready to go back into the earth. Then suddenly above her, she heard a shower of notes 
a glorious morning song. She looked up, and there was the swallow. The cold winter is coming again, he said, flying down to her. I've looked for you many times, and now I must fly away to the warm countries. Won't you come with me? I'll take you to where it is always summer. This time, Thumbelina did not hesitate. She climbed upon the swallow's back, then rose up into the sky. They flew over forests and fields, high above the mountains with snow-capped peaks. When Thumbelina felt cold in the bleak air, she crept under the swallow's feathers. It was so secure and close, a coverlet of the softest down. At last, they arrived in the warm countries. The sun beat down upon the earth, and the light was as clear as a crystal. Lemons and oranges hung on the trees, and the air was fragrant with the smell of spices. Remember, fragrant means having a pleasant smell or smelling good. The swallow flew on until they came to a dazzling white palace. In the pillars were many nests, and one of these was the swallow's home. I dearly love you and yearn to keep you with me, said the swallow sadly. But I do not think you could live up as high as I do, for when the wind comes you might fall. Why don't you take one of the flowers that grow below for your home? At least we shall be neighbors. Thumbelina did not remember that she had once lived before in a flower, but the idea seemed like a good one. The swallow set her gently on the petals of a brilliantly colored flower. Then she slid inside. But this could not be, she thought. This home was already taken. Who do you think's living in that flower? A young man was standing there, shining as if he had been made of glass. A gold crown was on his head, and gauzy wings grew from his back. Isn't he wonderful, Thumbelina thought. Never before had she seen a person just her size. The young man explained to Thumbelina that a small person lived in each of these flowers. He was their king. Then he took off his crown and placed it upon Thumbelina's head. You are so lovely, he said. Won't you be my queen? Thumbelina never thought to refuse. She could tell he was kind by the sound of his voice and the curve of his mouth. She felt that at last she had come home. Then the king declared that there was to be a welcoming party more joyful than any seen before in the land. From all the flowers, men and women came, bringing gifts to Thumbelina. But the most wonderful was a pair of tiny wings that could be fastened to her back so she too could dart among the flowers. Everyone danced all night, and above him in the, his nest was the swallow, singing for, him, for them his most heartwarming tune. The end. Go ahead, get a little break in, uh, wiggle break, get some water, something to smack on, and then come back for comprehension questions, okay? All right, who gives the magic seed to the woman in the beginning of the story? A wise old woman gives the magic seed to the woman, to Thumbelina's mama. What happens when the woman plants the seed? The seed grows into a flower with Thumbelina inside of it. This story has many settings because it takes place in different places. What were some of the settings in this story? In the um, walnut shell in the very beginning, right? Uh, with the toad on a lily pad. Along the shore. With the field mouse. And with the swallow. What other story has had many settings as the main character had many adventures? Tom Thumb, right? How does the swallow help Thumbelina escape the mole at the end of the story? The swallow rescues her from marrying the mole and takes her to a wonderful enchanted land where she meets other tiny people. How does the way that Tom Thumb escapes the wolf at the end of the story contrast, or how is it different, than the way that Thumbelina escapes the mole? Tom Thumb tricks the wolf by leading him to his parents' house to eat food so that the wolf doesn't eat him, right? 
and then his father chases the wolf away. But Thumbelina, she had somebody kind helping her escape, right? So folk tales sometimes teach lessons, just like fables do. Is there a lesson or something we can learn and use in our own lives from this folk tale? How about a little person can do great and wonderful things? All right. Which of these folk tales did you like better and why? All right, let's get into our word work, okay? In the read aloud you heard, when the woman held her, she discovered that the tiny, the tiny girl was scarcely the size of her thumb. I want you to say the word scarcely for me. Scarcely. Now I want you to say it in a whisper voice. Scarcely. And now I want you to say it in a robot voice. Scarcely. Scarcely means barely, hardly, or almost not. Thumbelina was barely the size of an, the old woman's thumb. It could also mean that you were almost not able to do something, like finishing a big dinner. Ted scarcely made it to school on time because the bus was late. I want you to tell me when you are scarcely or barely able to do something. Try to use the word scarcely when you tell about it. What's the word we've been talking about? Scarcely. All right, guys, let's make sure that we have um, completed all of our learning objectives. So we identified elements of stories and elements of a folktale we heard read aloud. We are going to do similarities and differences between Thumbelina and Tom Thumb um, a little more in detail in your Nearpod. We were able to demonstrate an understanding of the word scarcely. And you are going to use a graphic organizer to compare and contrast two folktales in your Nearpod. Awesome job, guys. See you next time.